Hello, and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 5, segment 11, and we'll try to use the skills we picked up in the previous videos about how to use the debugger to fix another very silly program. This example is of course once again a bit contrived, but will hopefully serve to illustrate the iterative process of debugging a program, while at the same time driving home some of the coding practices I keep insisting on. Here, let's take a look. Here is a very simple main function that calls out to a function print buffs, which looks like this. The function takes a numeric argument, allocates some memory for a few buffers, copies some data into the buffers, reads some data input from the user, and prints the result. Easy enough, right? Okay. So compiling the program already gives us a warning here about the use of the inherently unsafe gets function, but we'll ignore this because of course we do. We're real normal programmers, and who has time to pay attention to compiler warnings? And so when we run it, of course, sec fault. But you knew that was coming, didn't you? All right. So what do we do when we run into this sort of problem? We run the program in the debugger. Here's main, and here's the print buffs function. Note that we were able to list the code from multiple different source files without having to specify the file name, which is really quite convenient. We run the program, and segfault. But this time, we notice something interesting. The segfault occurred not in any of our functions, but in, well, somewhere in libc. We only get question marks here because our standard C library does not have debugging symbols, so the debugger can't look into it quite like it can into our code. So let's take a look at our backtrace. The error still happened in main. Let's select the frame in question. There, the error happened right here. Note that the sec fault occurred in libc, not in print buffs, so it must have happened in the call to str2l. We pass argv1 to str2l, so let's inspect argv. argv is a char star star, as per the main function prototype. What is the first element of argv? To get the first element of an array, we can look at the memory location. and we'll find the path to the executable here as we'd expect. That is, star argv and argv0 are the same thing, as per standard C pointer semantics. Now, what's argv1? Well, that's null, as we didn't provide any command and arguments, and so passing null as the argument to str is likely what caused our sec fault here. Let's fix that. We add a check to our main function to ensure proper usage of the program. Oh, right, we need the standard I.O. header for fprintf. There. Now, when we run the program without arguments, we get a proper usage statement. So far, so good. So now we need to provide a number. Let's give it a number. How about minus 1? There, the program now prompts us for input. Let's say, hey there. And yep, of course we get another sec fault. So again, here we go. This should be routine by now. Yep. 
get reads the data into the buffer that we allocated up here. And, yep, strike fault in gets. Our backtrace shows the call stack. Main called print buffs, print buffs called gets, and get stack faulted. Let's look at frame 1. What's n here? Negative 1. What's buff? The buffer into which gets tries to read data. Why, it's null once more. Which really isn't surprising. We told malloc to allocate negative 1 bytes, so of course that failed. But since we didn't error check our function, we then tried to access null to put data from the user in ergo segfault. But rather than fix things right away, let's confirm our theory by inspection. We break in print buffs and run again with negative 1 as the argument. Alright, n is negative 1. What data type is n? Ah, it's a long. Suppose we hadn't used negative 1 with a different value, what would have happened? Let's give it a try. In GDB, we can manipulate variables at runtime, so even though we passed in negative 1, we can change that to a different value now. Negative 1 is obviously bogus, and we don't know how much data the user might want to type, so let's make sure we get a large enough buffer by setting n to a really long number. Check and confirmed, n is now 1024 with many zeros. So now if we're continuing, then malloc will not try to allocate negative 1 bytes, but that many instead. We can enter data again, and again sec fault in the same location, because buff is again null, which also again is not surprising. We try to allocate an insane amount of memory for buff, almost a petabyte. Of course a malloc will fail to do that, but we once again didn't check the return value, so there. Let's update our program and fix it so that it verifies whether malloc succeeded, regardless of what value the user entered on the command line. Here we change our code. And once again, this is how all your code should look. If malloc fails, error. Always check the return value of any function that might fail and handle the error appropriately. Here, repeat for the other buffers too. Now, let's compile it. And Hooray! No longer can the user enter bogus numbers here. But what happens when we enter a reasonable number on the command line? Well, we'll take a look at that in our next video. For now, let's just note that we were able to see that our debugger has no problem tracing the execution of our program and correlate it to the lines of code even across multiple source files. However, if the error occurs at a location in the code for which we do not have debugging symbols present, such as when the failure takes place in a function that is provided as part of the standard C library, then the debugger can only tell us that the error took place or provide other minimal information. Finally, we saw in this example that not only are we able to passively observe the execution of the program, we also can change the program as it is running. For example, we can assign a variable a different value to see how our program might behave. Now our program looks like it behaves, but we have just one more video to go through so I can show you how we can use a debugger to inspect specific locations in memory, as well as to help you understand how arrays and pointers work in C. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.